He is not only the voice of MMA and boxing for Showtime Sports, he's the voice of uh, pro wrestling for New Japan Pro Wrestling on Axis with Josh Barnett. He's done video games. He does podcasts. You can literally pick this man up on the fillings in your teeth, ladies and gentlemen. It's Mauro <laughs> Ronaldo. Mauro, thank you. I've been waiting to give that to somebody, that intro. You can pick him up, much like the famous episode of Gilligan's Island, on the fillings in your teeth. Why, why are you everywhere now? I'm living the impossible dream, Mr. Cornett. And before I go any further, I just want to uh, say what an honor and privilege it is to uh, speak with you and, and hopefully maybe pick your brain a little bit because uh, following pro wrestling as a kid and getting into it as a kid and starting my career at 16, I, I really looked up to uh, uh, people like yourself and, and maybe someone whose name I, I won't be able to mention on this show, but I really uh, appreciate everything you've uh, done for the business, and it's uh, just a treat to talk to you. Well, no, who was the other name? Well, Paul Paul Heyman is also a oh, guy that Paulie, I really no, admire. No, 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 we inspired, we, between the two of us, we inspired more perverted teenage children to enter a life of debauchery <laughs> than any other. Just, I was the Southern influence. He was the Northern influence. Uh, but no, and you I, guys I, were two of the very best to ever uh, uh, be on a stick. So uh, I just wanted to, to let that be known as well. Well, and, and that's the thing, because I was reading your bio, and we'll, we'll talk more about you <laughs> later. First, enough about you. Let's talk about me. What Let's do you talk think about me. Was, no, uh, uh, in your bio, we have more similarities than, than I realized, but we were both child prodigies. Uh, and and you were you were influenced by pro wrestling at an early age, but then you actually went out and got got real jobs. Uh, amazingly enough, in in broadcasting and radio and 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 television and things and sort of the nature of which people actually work full time in and and have careers in and, and have done, you know, surprisingly well for yourself considering you know your lack of talent you started with and the, so. I'm roasting my own guest. Be but, nice. Be nice now. <laughs> hey, if anyone is going to insult me and, and keep doing so, I would want it to be Jim Cornette. So I'm, no, I'm we get that request all the time. Everybody wants Jim yeah. Cornette to tell them to go fuck themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I, sh- I should actually, I should have a, you know, a, like a Christmas fuck you package. I will, for Christmas, I'll call somebody up and tell them to fire. But it's, it, anyway, back to, back tomorrow. Uh, you're, you're on a lot of tomorrow Netflix today. Days, and you're calling a lot of, 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 of different combat sports, but you, you started, your love was wrestling. And that's when you were a teenager and you started, and you worked for le- le- the legendary Al Tomko, Canadian promoter, par excellence, right? Wow. Did you did you say that with tongue stuck firmly in cheek or? Well, it, I don't know if, when you worked for Tomco, I know where he would have stuck it if it had been up to him. But I'm, you know, it could have been <laughs> near your cheek. Now, all kidding aside, I will I will not besmirch the the legacy of one Sir Aloysius Tomco because at the end of the day, if it weren't for Mister Tomco, I would not be talking to you right now. And I guess. Uh, that can be uh, debated whether that's a good or bad thing, Mr. Cornette. But no, uh, Al Tomko discovered me in my high school in 1986. I was in grade 12. Uh, had already been doing a lot of broadcasting the school with the PA announcements, all that uh, stuff, working in the school newspaper. Uh, but like yourself, Jim, I, I knew at a very young age, like when I was five years old, what I wanted to do. And I wanted to be the heavyweight champion of the world in the NWA, WWF, whatever, wherever. But uh, physically was never uh, gifted with the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the tools, so to speak. But I developed I, I, can, a... I can identify with you up, up to, that, <laughs> to that point there, yes. <laughs> well, but I also knew I had a very curious mind, and I, I loved uh, reading. I loved information, so I thought, you know what? Maybe I can be a, a wrestling commentator or a broadcaster in general. And I was, again, grew up, uh, it, it, it's a... Not that exciting, really, in a small town in, in Mountain, British Columbia. But again, you at a young age, what I wanted to do, and, and practically the rest of my life, the next 10 years, were auditioning for what would happen uh, when I was discovered in high school by Al Tomko uh, as a ring announcer. He brought me to uh, TV studios within two weeks, and for the next three years, I was uh, flying by the seat of my pants, uh, really not being smartened up. I used to think the k room was where they kept all the foreign wrestlers in the... Uh, in the uh, promotion. So I was reading <laughs> draft, uh, Jim, 
And, uh, and hey, now, now, wait a minute. Uh, now, don't don't gloss over that because now, how old were you at that particular point? I was sixteen years old. Yeah, is okay, and you're in you're in a situation where here are these grown adult men who are doing things that you you're up close enough. No, some of them now are implausible, but they're not letting in letting you in on it. And you don't Correct. want to be the one. You don't want to be the one to fucking pick up the subject. So you have to call it. You have to act completely straight, if for nothing else, than to not expose to them that you know that something may be going on. In which case, they might beat you up and kick you the fuck out of there, right? Absolutely. And Jim, it's it's funny you even say that because uh, you know I was debilitatingly shy as a youngster, which I know is 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 the biggest, uh, you know, oxymoron or whatever you want to say now with what I've chosen to do. But I think a lot of people in our business, and I don't know for you, the the fact that I was so shy and and never really allowed to spread my wings, I think, allowed me at a young age when when released from the the chains of the home life and and the, the, you know, the the, the restraints kind of put on with whatever. We all go through our our, our things in our, our childhood. As, 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 as New Jack, New Jack used to say, chained in the bowels of a slave ship. You <laughs> threw off the, the shackles of oppression. And yes, were, yes, you were still so. alive filled with religious freedom. And it said, blah, blah, blah. But you could... <laughs> yes, I know what but you no, yes. It just seems like I, I was able to, uh, you know, be myself in school. And I discovered, uh, you know, when you announce things or you're the center of attention, people are either laughing at you or with you, but it was still attention. And then, and so when I first started with pro wrestling uh, at a TV show that was across Canada, even though, you know, again, it may have been one of the worst studio uh, wrestling shows at the time because it was at the, the tail end of uh, what had been a, a crown jewel in, in the NWA gym with uh, Vancouver, you know, Gene Kaniski came through there, Don Leo Jonathan. Uh, oh my God! Well, no, the, we we answered uh, a question about this, I think, on the drive-through a few weeks ago or whatever. But the point is, in Vancouver was a, a town that drew ten thousand, twelve thousand people for wrestling for big shows during hot periods throughout, like the fifties and sixties. It, it was a, considered a major wrestling city, and then had fallen on <laughs> disrepair, shall we say? And I was there for the, the the death knell, as it were. But again, it was proved to be a launch pad to. So as you said, uh, real radio and TV jobs, and and I will always be grateful. It was a crash course in in ad libbing, uh, improvisation. Uh, never given a script, never given uh, much in terms of what I was told. I was said, you know, go put over these women. Go and this is the this is the feud Saturday night. Put it over as much as you can. And and so for me, I took it upon myself. I, I started, you know, mo- using quotes and, and listening to movies. And then, uh, of all people, the late, great Rowdy Roddy Piper, who was always and, and continues to be uh, one of my favorites, who, as we know, also really uh, cut his teeth and, and did very well in the Pacific Northwest with Don Owen. But he also worked in Vancouver in the beginning of the 80s with Rick Martell, the Sheepherders. Anyway, mid-80s, he stops by, and he told me to... He, I guess, you know, he impressed the fact that I, I could actually string together enough uh, coherent uh, words to make a sentence. And he said that I should keep a, a book of notes and anything that comes to mind, whether it's a one-liner or you hear a joke you like, you can put it in your own terms. And, and that's what really uh, crystallized in me that, man, maybe I can do something with this. And to be honest, there was a, a period of time at 19, WCW, you were in WCW at the time, I wanted to approach WCW and yourself as, as Billy Cornette with a badminton racket instead of a tennis <laughs> racket and be your nerdy little brother and, and have you kind of, uh, you know, take, but I, I never heard back from Jim Hurd. Hey, I, I'll tell you what, I would have rather had you in, in Houston in 1984 instead of my cousin Percy Cornette when, when Dundee booked me to get my head shaved twice the same week. So I got shaved, yeah, I got shaved in New Orleans and in Houston, we brought Jim Jameson, this Memphis job guy, down as Percy Cornette. Place was fucking sold out, so they gave him five hundred dollars more. He more than he'd made in a week wrestling ever, just to come that down awesome. and shaved in front of all those people. No, uh, but but I, that, that is fantastic. But I'm I'm being honest. Like I wrote a letter and and everything else, and uh, and then uh, when when the promotion you know shut down, I had already left, seeing the writing on the wall and. And knowing, you know, I couldn't make it on $25 uh, 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 in appearance, I decided to, to get into mainstream, you know, broadcasting. I was a club DJ, uh, radio DJ, radio sports, and, and now, you know, good play-by-play for everything. And like you say, surprisingly, 
this is my 29th year as a professional broadcaster and, and very blessed. Well, yeah, and here's the thing, and let, and let me ask you this, because truthfully, I, I, I could tell you the last boxing match I watched live probably involved Muhammad Ali, uh, and I've not, I, I keep up with what happens after the fact in boxing, so I've not seen your work in boxing. I have, however, heard you call professional wrestling and, and mixed martial arts, and they're pretty similar. I guess the question I'm trying to ask you is, was it hard for you to learn to be a good boxing analyst since wrestling and, and mixed martial arts are, are somewhat, they're different branches of the same tree. Well, there's, there's someone trying to call me now to sell me something. Toll free call. <laughs> but yes, we got a big budget here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it, it, they're bra- different branches of the same tree. Boxing is, is over and it's another uh, flowered species entirely. Uh, was it difficult for you to adapt to calling boxing too? Is it also, have you ever had a conflict with uh, with some of your networks because you do wrestling stuff and the boxing promoters, or, or are, is, are they over with with that now? With, oh, we don't yeah, want to no, good wrestling. stuff. And, and for, in fact, I, I want to uh, kind of uh, take umbrage to your, to your analogy using uh, the, the trees, though, because I really think that all of them are branches from the same tree. I think maybe boxing, because of its more... Uh, dare I say, storied history. It's not always been storied, but because of its tenure, uh, maybe people, you know, it's a sweet science, and there was a yeah, that time when the heavyweight champion was indeed the baddest man in the world. But but I really believe that all three of them uh, have similarities, and especially, Jim, and something you can uh, definitely, uh, you know, support and attest to, the, the marketing. And you've said it. I remember you said it early, like UFC does pro wrestling better than, than pro wrestling at times. And, and boxing as much as it was, uh, you know, ingrained in it in its presentation and, and, you know, like you say, the golden era of the heavyweights, uh, I didn't find too much difficulty making the transition because at the end of the day, I tried to be a storyteller as much as anything. Maybe certain things you want to change, but you're always trying to temper anyway, Jim, and, and it's like you're providing lyrics to the, to the song and you ride the peaks and valleys. So, I don't think it was a big transition, but there are definite uh, similarities, I believe. And in this day and age, I think if you're a boxing fan, you should be an MMA fan and vice versa. And, and everybody, Jim, whether they want to admit it or not, everyone begins a pro wrestling fan. Well, because it, it, everybody, whether they want to admit it or not, deep down, they want to see people argue and fight with each other it, it, in right. in some respect. And and actually, the, sometimes they will see them argue more than they want to see them fight. Uh, which is pretty much the basis of pro wrestling, but in in some cases. But uh, well, here's the thing. Then, uh, it, uh, am I crazy, or when I say that, am I crazy to say that uh, the most profitable and, and most successful pro wrestling promotion in the world today is the UFC? And and am I crazy to say that uh, mixed martial arts is using wrestling's tricks because we're not using them anymore? So somebody might as well. Do you? Do well, you, they, I, I guess you know, I. I well, I, yes, I say yes, and, and with, uh, with a caveat, I think uh, we are seeing what, uh, I mean, just even this, this past Monday night, of all things, believe it or not, like I, I was very uh, pleased with the, 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 the wrestling, the actual amount of uh, wrestling on, on Raw, and I think, as we all know throughout history, when you lose the big names or the faces, that's when you're forced to, to maybe do things which you should maybe have been doing all along in terms of you know, pushing other people or, or giving them the opportunity to, to apply their, their craft. And, and for me, I think MMA definitely has taken from uh, WWE Vince McMahon's playbook in terms of, you know, you, you have to market the stars, but you also want to market the brand. And UFC is like synonymous with MMA. It's like Phoenix, even though, you know, there have been tremendous promotions in the past, like Strike Force, Pride Fighting Championships, even Bellator uh, actually outdrew the UFC on a recent show. But it's, it's all about the marketing. You're right. But in terms of pro wrestling in itself, I think pro wrestling can can enjoy another revival, Jim, in terms of what we're seeing now with New Japan, Ring of Honor, uh, even WWE. I think there there just needs to be more focus on storytelling inside the ring. And, and maybe the rise of New Japan to its niche popularity here in North America may be helping that because I, I don't think we are, unless it's you or Paul Heyman, honestly, I, I don't. We don't need interminable promos to to bore everybody. 
<laughs> well, and, uh, I know, because if, if you had me and Heyman, you'd have all the interminable promos to bore everybody you'd ever need. <laughs> uh, well, but no, you know, and he, he, I guess here's the thing is, is that now WWE and mainstream wrestling, let's say, has become synonymous entertainment wrestling. It's such a kid's thing or a casual fan thing or the, you know, whatever teeny bopper thing or whatever thing it is that, that, that it's created almost a market on a complete other side for totally athletic uh, wrestling. The problem is that market has not really been uh, created. It's not big enough yet, uh, mm. nor is it at the same time uh, fully defined yet as to what that creative uh, athletic wrestling should be, whether it's Ring of Honor, whether it's Lucha, whether it's all the sure. niche wrestlings that depend on in-ring because that's what the wrestling fans in of previous generations, they got in ring, but they also had the personalities. And that's why I've sure, said, and that's what, I yeah, love the New Japan too. show and you guys do such a great job on the New Japan show, but I'd love, and I know you're not, you know, I know you're doing a voiceover also. I know you're not right there yeah, all exactly. the time. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, I would love to see you on camera with the microphone with those two guys having a hell of an argument that I could understand and slapping each other in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't, that's the only thing I can't get. And I can't get my promos anymore. I, well, it, what about NXT, Jim? Because I think if that is the, the blueprint for the future, then I'm, you know, I know a WWE is a favorite promotion. Everyone to, to, to criticize and, and kick around. And I've done my own fair share because of the fact you're right. Maybe uh, I'm 45 now. So uh, I, I, you know, I've seen on many different styles and generations uh, of pro wrestling. And, and yet, like I say, I enjoyed uh, WWE last night because there the, the roster is very talented and and it comes down to a creative and I know the creative is is difficult you've done it many times Jim and I, I know how ridiculously hard it must be to to do three hours let alone five hours that WWE has to do now but when I look at NXT and and that's Triple H's brain child if if that's the future of WWE then then I I'm cautiously optimistic am I nuts. Well, and I don't think so, and I think that, you know, everybody's always said, and, and I, you know, deep down I knew it was true, but I thought it might have been talk at one point that the shit will change when Vince is dead, but I think at this point some shit will change when Vince is dead. Um, and I think that, that at this point, you know, Triple H probably, he understands what this generation wants and that he, they need to make new, younger stars. The problem that I think is that, it's harder than ever to make stars and there's fewer people listening and watching. Uh, if you're, you're standing on a platform in a park screaming your message, uh, your, your message doesn't spread if there's not anybody listening to it. And the eyeballs right. are down on wrestling because it's been uncool and it's been blah, blah, blah. And also, to me, the, the, the mystery is not there. The intrigue, it's, it's played out. Everybody knows. That there's never been a time where the fans were not uh, were any more aware that – the talent walking down the aisle is has been hired by a company and told to do something and told what their name was, told them what to say, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's now, to be honest, I th you know, New Japan, and I want to talk about the New Japan gig and how it happened, but while we're, we're getting sure. into this, I think that's why that Ronda Rousey, two chicks fought, as Star Maker yep. Boland put it to me, uh, just the day after it happened, two chicks fought in a stadium and drew 70,000 people and got eyes on pay-per-view around the world on them. And, it, and if, if somebody had said to me and Kenny Bolin at the Louisville Gardens in 1978, yeah, two, two women are going to fight in 2015 and 70,000 people are going to go to the stadium, see them. And they're going to be pay-per-view around the world. But yeah. You're fucking insane. Right. Um, it, but it, they want to see the conflict. UFC has taken over for pro wrestling as the fucking cool thing just now because there's so worldwide uh, communication. It's on a worldwide scale, but it's taken over to be the cool thing that the the young kids like because they yell and scream at each other and then they go and fight. Right. And that, see, that's the, the whole real formula for New Japan pro wrestling. And, I mean, we're talking about Ronda Rousey now uh, in, in the wake of her, uh, you know, upset loss to – to Holly Holm on Saturday, but that's the that's the other thing that you know UFC can do that WWE or pro wrestling in general can is when you book your your stars, you know, at the end of the day, you're right, they still have to fight. It's a real fight, and as we saw on on Saturday, Holly Holm executed the perfect game plan in in defeating uh, 
Ronda Rousey, and I, I really believe that when the rematch rolls around at UFC 200, which is most likely uh, now the run is going to take some time off and, and need some time off, I, I really wonder how she'll come back from this mentally. I, I called Ronda's fights earlier in her career, and I could see, you know, where she was an emotional person, which is definitely not necessarily a negative when you see the drive and commitment and, and what she's been able to accomplish and how she's transcended mixed martial arts to become you know, one of the most popular and, and recognizable athletes uh, around the world. But at the end of the day, she still had to fight. And and see, this is where the UFC, again, it, it, it's all about marketing the stars. Uh, you, you're right. You have your conflicts. And then the but, hey, you, you know what? Fight. You know what? Reality sometimes is a better booker than a big... Yeah. <laughs> You're right about Reality that. Reality sometimes is a better booger than Vince and, and his creative staff. But in this in this case, I, it, it was clearly and is, say what you want, but I think a a a, a boxer, a high level boxer, was probably the biggest weakness that R- R- Ronda Rousey would have, being a high level jujitsu judo expert and etc. A stand up striker, you would not think she would want to fight. And here's a, so that's a perfect nemesis. Um, and at the same time, she had never looked awkward before. She had a couple of times where she charged or she swung and she was off balance and she staggered. Did did Holly Holm, was she just sticking her when she wanted to in the face? Did that just rattle Ronda Rousey? Alliteration there oh, for I, the I first think, time ever? Yeah, I think Rousey was rattled 24 hours uh, prior at the uh, weigh-in when, when uh, Holm put her right uh, – Fist right just into her face as, as uh, you know, Ronda mean mugger and Ronda has that, that game face look that she likes to, to turn on for the fights. But I, I think there was already a, a chink in the armor. And then come uh, the fight night, you, you said it yourself, Ronda Rousey is a world-class judica, obviously a tremendous uh, submission, um, you know, machine, especially when it comes to the arm bars. And I think that's why everyone jumped on board. And, and you know what? Right place, right time as well, Jim. And, and you only... As good, I think, at the end, even though in the social media age with the hype and the marketing of a of a good-looking woman that is undefeated kicking, you know, someone's uh, behind that, that people jumped on that. People who aren't even MMA fans or who don't even know the, you know, the, 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 the wristwatch from the wristwatch, as uh, good old Gorilla Monsoon would say. It's it's that where, where Ronda connected, but in terms of fighting, if people studied Holly Holm and really knew where she came from, and, and this is why... It was stunning, but I'm not at all surprising what transpired Saturday because Holly Holm is built to defeat someone like Ronda Rousey, who has only been in mixed martial arts for four years. And so that means she's only been working on her striking for that long, and she was unable to make any adjustments. Holly Holm has been a, a, a multiple-time world boxing champion, national kickboxing <laughs> champion. She's been with her coach for 20 years, and her coach, Mike Winkeljohn, and, and the other man, Greg Jackson, are two of the very best in the game. So, yeah, but the and, and then to, to be honest, I also knew that Rousey was rattled because not only did home, she was sticking her anytime she wanted in the face and just like the little short ones and not knockout shots, but just bap, just fuck you, bap, bap. Uh, and, and she nailed a couple of kids, but also she took her down the one time, didn't she? Right. Or did yeah, I, yeah, did no, I dream she that? Was, she took hey, Rousey which, which, down? Uh, yeah, she did, but, you know, which wasn't probably the smartest thing to do, and I think she was instantly cognizant of that. I think it was more of a, look, I can take you down, too, and watch. I'll get right back up. She also yeah, I think that was, a, I, think she, I think she rattled her head. She rattled her head with yeah, that. Yeah, well, and I, the key, though, was the fact that Ronda Rousey has decent footwork, but not very intelligent uh, pressure footwork, and that means cutting off the, the cage and, and trying to pin uh, home against the cage, where she's had tremendous success against a much shallower talent pool. This is the other part that people may be missing. The fact that women's MMA, uh, you know, has only been around for maybe 12 years to, you know, 15 years if you go back to Japan. But at this level, it started with Gina Toronto and Julie Kensey on Showtime in 2007. So it's been less than a decade. And no offense to the rest of the women's bantamweight division. But up until now, Rousey had never faced anyone with those kinds of striking skills. Uh, Sarah Kaufman, the Canadian, uh, had, a, had an opportunity, and, and Misha Tate was was Cupcake. I, Cupcake. I, I love though, Cupcake. Oh, yeah, Cupcake. <laughs> that's right. 
But you know what, Jim? I think a lot of it has to do with that, the fact that UFC and, and the, the media jumped on the bandwagon and started marketing Ronda as the new Mike Tyson. And, and there was this aura and this mystique of this ultra-confident superwoman and, you know, female empowerment. So it, everyone drew well, but now, also, And here, that's what the wrestling is supposed to do. Ronda can come back now is it because I mean, one defeat is not going to, she's not no. gone forever. You know, she'll make the comeback and blah, blah, blah. She'll be a star. But you know, who? Chris Cyborg has to be, oh. Oh, Jesus Christ. I just lost $25 million. Well, what is it? They find her hanging <laughs> she is, uh, for the lamppost. Yeah, she's somewhere. wondering what, what, what happened for sure. Although it's done properly. And I know it's all about star power. So you're right. The fake a dream fight as usual in MMA falls by the wayside because, well, business, you have to continue to sell pay-per-views every month and are sometimes forced to, to, you know, put together the best of the best because that's what people want to see. And that's where pro wrestling could definitely uh, do a better job of these days. But it hey, of wait, 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 let, me, let me ask you, let me ask you now, and I'm not going to mention any names, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Jim Cornette Experience. The last thing we want to do is create controversy. Um, so I'm not going to mention any names, but there are people in, in, in the wrestling industry who have floated the idea that, that this was a work and Gosh. that they, just, they wanted to take, uh, uh, are you clearing your throat over there? <laughs> they, yeah. Yeah. They wanted to, uh, take the belt off of Rhonda cause she's going to make a movie. So they're going to do an injury <laughs> angle or whatever. And, and, and put the belt in and maybe the other girl wasn't in on it. Maybe the referee wasn't in on it. Please, Mauro, what can you do oh. to help me in, in English words that people can understand say bullshit? Oh, man, this is the second interview of the day and the second time it's been talked about. And I'm a big uh, admirer of Mr. Uh, Taz was on his podcast. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's beyond the BS for the simple fact that it's, a, it's frankly, I mean, yes, people can say, well, it happened in boxing back in the day. It happened, you know, maybe in Japan. It's happened. It, it, there is so much at stake, and, and, it, and, and the, the fallout of, of that would be uh, uh, untenable. Like, I mean, you'd go to jail, it would be, it, it is absolutely ridiculous to think that. And, and the fact that, you know, who would allow themselves to, to go through what Ronda Rousey has gone through? And again, I know Ronda to a degree in calling her fights and, and know people close to her in the past who, I, I know she can be very emotional, and there's no way on earth she believes it. This is part of the reason. This is so stunning and, and so devastating to her. She believed her own life, but and at that level, I guess you have to, but you also have to prepare, and you have to have more than, than one game plan, and her typical game plan fell by the wayside, and Holly Holm, uh, again, I, I think more has to be said about what Holly Holm did and not what Ronda Rousey didn't do in this fight because I, I think uh, Holly Holm is going to beat her even faster in the rematch, and, and the fact well, that people and- are, are screaming work, well, you know, let them scream. It's clickbait. And the whole thing, it just, it, to me, it's this, is Dana White, who has built literally a billion-dollar sport in the last 10 years from fucking scratch. Right. And, and has now the most dominant athlete on pay-per-view and mixed combat sports, martial arts, whatever. Yep. Uh, and to the, for the sake of working an angle, because she's gonna go away do a movie, is he gonna fix the fight of the one of the the biggest woman's fight of all time? And you know that this shit cannot stay in. At least wrestling has proven that. And he's gonna risk his entire empire on this on this high profile fight that people are looking for any at, at a time when people are looking for any reason to fucking take MMA or UFC in particular down. Whether it be the sure. culinary workers union or, or their yes, political opponents or whatever. And he's going to do it because we want to work an angle because she's going to take time off to do a movie. No, what? No. Seriously? I, I, I mean, Fuck. I think uh, that was that was a master troll. And I, I, I congratulate uh, Mr. Taz on, on uh, the troll. But there's no way on earth. Uh, and for the reasons you just uh, articulated, uh, it's. <laughs> You know, it's just, it's, yeah. you don't mean he's trying to get, he's trying to get no. a, a publicity of, he's trying to get high rated podcasts like us, me and Alice, who are on more air. It's almost like TV. When TV first came around, it was pro wrestling that, that really put it on the map. And now with podcasting, it seems like it's everyone in pro wrestling that's, uh, that's doing the numbers. And you know, it's beca- and actually I think it's because now people know this is podcast shit. They tell the truth there. 
Um, right. Let me ask you about uh, the the New Japan television gig, though, and and I'm jealous you get to call serious wrestling. And and to me, the commentary team reflects the flavor of the promotion, whether Lance Russell and Dave Brown in Memphis or you know, etc. I think serious wrestling programs now go with a Mike Goldberg, Joe Rogan flavor. I wanted to do that with Kevin Kelly and Adam Pierce in in Ring of Honor originally, and we've we've told a story before where they let the merchandise weasel dictate the fucking on air announced talent. Um, mm. You and you and and Josh Barnett to me are a classic example of the the well versed announcer and the fucking uh, veteran. And it, Rogan seems like a veteran. He's jacked up, but he he knows every goddamn hole. <laughs> yeah. So he gets by, even though he's never, you know, he gets by with right. it. But right. you, you've really taken it's it's refined. Jim Ross and anybody has the same flavor. The very knowledgeable announcer and the the well spoken uh, veteran competitor who can actually talk about this shit like a sport. And that's why it's it's so uh, mirror opposite from. And then you look at the other places, and the you know the announcers are. <laughs> Uh, anyway, well, how did that come about? How did you just say, "Hey, New Japan, I'll I'll call your fucking wrestling for you"? <laughs> well, thank you very much, first of all, for the kind words. And in fact, uh, I received a call from Adam Swift at Access TV. Uh, I know Adam. Last- Adam Swift, yeah, from Access TV and the the Inside MMA Show, and they have their Friday night uh, fight lineups as well. But he um, huh. he called me at the end of last year. And uh, had said that they had made a deal with uh, TBSI to uh, present some New Japan Pro Wrestling. They wanted to uh, use it as a lead into their their Friday Night Fights lineup, and and uh, I guess I was, uh, you know, I I known Adam through my uh, my other experiences in mixed martial arts and and doing my radio show up in Canada. But he had said that I was the first name he uh, came to his mind in terms of pro uh, doing commentary, and and I know a lot of people. At the time, maybe didn't realize that I did pro wrestling commentary for Stampede Wrestling, and I mean I've done play by play for wrestling. <laughs> Wait, but this is 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 it fucking great though? What year was this? What year was this? Last year, at the end of this, last year, in twenty fourteen, so because... at the end of twenty fourteen, correct? Okay, because. You know, Axis used to be HDNet and Ring of Honor correct. up until two thousand eleven or whatever that's was right. on HDNet. That's right. That's uh, right. for, for two years, right? And and that's where I know Adam from. And Adam's a nice young man, and he was a wrestling fan. And, and he wasn't the, to be honest, the guy that made all the decisions there at that time. I'm sure his his uh, uh, cloud has risen. risen. Um, but, uh, but at any rate, at the time, I'm just thinking, my God, it was just separated by a couple of years that New Japan Wrestling might have had Mike, uh, uh, what was his name? Oh, Jesus Christ. Mike Hogwood. Mike Hogwood, oh. who who announced Ring of Honor on HDNet. Do you remember him? <laughs> yeah. The worst uh, wrestling laugh, announcer. Yeah, I, 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 I don't want to remember, but I do vaguely remember. Yes, and, and, and I love Adam. I'm not knocking Adam if he's a listener to the program, and I highly doubt it because I'm sure he's a busy young man. But I went to them when I first started with Ring of Honor. They'd already been on about six months on HDNet, and they had gotten Mike Hogwood who announced basketball out of the Carolinas, regional basketball or whatever to be through the HD net had gotten him to be the wrestling announcer. Yep. And he was impossible. It was, it was brutal. And so I had Kevin Kelly come down and had Adam asked for a meeting with the the producer from HD net and et cetera. And presented, I said, here, Kevin Kelly is a professional announcer. You know, he's, he's worked with the WWE, he's announced with The Rock, blah, 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 and, and we will not live long enough to, to, for Mike Hogwood to be a good wrestling announcer. And, and, and he was like 65 years old at the time, and that's when I found out that Hogwood was a real good friend with the producer, and the producer didn't want anybody who was going to turn it into the wrestling network. So, <laughs> I swear, oh if it had been five years ago, Mike Hogwood yeah. could have been announcing New Japan. Could Thank been, God. Could have been announcing New Japan. You never know. But no, I was, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I was surprised and also very happy because I've been a big time follower. I, I've followed all the territories. Every I've been a pro wrestling fan, like I say, since I was probably just outside the womb. And, uh, and so I, I knew the product. I've been, you know, following it, but, uh, it was 
you know, I was interested to see what would be, you know, what I'd be able to do with Josh and, and the fact that I was doing the boxing and MMA. And, and I think it's just, uh, it shows the sign of the times. And also I hope, uh, you know, the work and commitment that I put into, to be able to do both. And I know that some wrestling announcers, especially our, our good friend, Jim, Jim Ross have been stigmatized maybe in the past unfairly because of the pro wrestling thing. But I, um, I think people in 2015, or I hope Jim, uh, are able to know that, well, yeah, you know, this combat sports is, is shoot fighting and, and professional wrestling is a, a, a choreographed form of athletic entertainment and, and as real as it gets in its own right. And, and honestly, I, I think there, there should be no stigma. And yeah, I'm biased, but I mean, why would there be? I, I think if you, well, uh, and, and, I, you I'm know, also, I, I love entertainment, Jim. I, I, I think that's part of what it drew me to pro wrestling is that I love sports and I love uh, drama, entertainment, storytelling, and I think pro wrestling, when done right, does it better than anything, uh, including the NFL or, or hockey. or I mean, pro wrestling at its highest form, the drama, the heat, rivals anything I've ever been a part of in, in MMA or boxing. Well, yeah, and, and, you know, that's the thing uh, is, to me, uh, the calling, the broadcasting, the announcing of guys having a conflict, a fight, uh, uh, whatever, a contest, uh, it, it, the same emotions are there and, and, and the same qualities are needed in an announcer. And it actually, the whole idea of, of calling uh, boxing or mixed martial arts is to impart the drama of the fight. Whereas in, in wrestling, it's to impart the drama of the choreographed fight. Uh, right. so you're still supposed to be calling it straight. So, you were better believe so, it. And, and, and I think, to be honest, I think my pro wrestling experience, the commentary experience with Sam Bean, it probably helped me in become an MMA and boxing announcer. And, and while we, you know, I think all announcers are polarizing, especially in this day and age of social media, and everyone has a voice and everyone thinks they can do better. And, and it's just the you know way it goes. But I, I feel the, the people who do appreciate my work know that it's also been owned by a background in professional wrestling and that's not just uh the negative connotations i'm talking about being able to tell uh you know the story in, in quick sound bites and and put the athletes over with with actual facts and and and, and like i say anecdotes and it's it's not rocket science jim but well n- nothing be- nothing keeps you on your toes more than wrestling because you can get complacent in boxing or mixed martial right. arts you might think oh i know what's exactly what's happening here right. you never know what's right. going on in the wrestling business has been no, proved. And that's, you're right. And that's, uh, I, again, there's a template for me. Everyone always asks. I have a basic template uh, for, for preparing for all of those uh, events, boxing, uh, MMA, pro wrestling. And, and I try to just keep files on, on the athletes and the individuals that just uh, look for, for connections to historical content or, or maybe even, you know, drop a pop culture reference to try to tie it into people who might just be sitting on the couch because their loved one is forcing them to like, I think nowadays we're all a brand of entertainment and we're all a, a form of, you know, just trying to keep everybody uh, riveted, especially on television. And so I, I believe you, you have to be prepared and you have to be passionate because you'll be, you'll be uh, exposed rather quickly if you're not. Well, hey, before we go, I'm going to give you the the tough task of gelling a lot of information down into brief sound bites because I well, want to know. Even before then, we need his anecdote. Oh, we need it. We need the antidote. Yes. Oh, actually, you know what? I I was able to to nicely done by the way, Alice. Nice memory, but it there you go. Good memory. We fed about. Alice that before before the program, Alice, folks. We fed. Uh, it was the, it was the <laughs> Billy Cornett uh, one, uh, Jim. So I managed to to sneak it in. It was when I uh, sent the letter to WCW asking to be your little brother, Billy Cornett, with a bandage and bracket. If, uh, the, there you go. We, we, we uh, Alice, so, the the antidote was delivered. It was. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> but no, you've been an obsessive fan since you were young. You got into business young. You've uh, in wrestling, uh, but also you've worked extensively with several different MMA promotions. Who's your favorite talent? I won't say uh, fighters or wrestlers. Who's your favorite talent to watch as a fan uh, through all of those years and all those careers? Wow, fantastic. Uh <laughs> I'm going to break it down into just the biggest things I've seen. Uh, Fedor Emelianenko in Japan, Mirko Krokop uh, in Japan, 
Uh, boxing wise, it has to be you know Floyd Mayweather, the 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 best boxer of his generation, one of the greatest defensive fighters of all time, and the fact that I was able to to call his uh, his final fight and his his the last six fights of his career were uh, beyond a career benchmark, but. I mean, Jim, that's a, it's, it's impossible to, to answer because I feel like I'm forced to come, truly. I, I've been involved with so many amazing uh, moments and events in, in not just one genre of combat sports, but all of them, including kickboxing. I rated and for me, is one of the best TV uh, combat sports there is. Uh, but, but honestly, I think uh, it, there have been too many, and I'm glad there have been too many because that just shows the level of talent uh, that that who who was your right now in all of those sports. Who was your favorite wrestler when you were a kid? Growing up, uh, my favorite I really admired Nature Boy Ric Flair. I loved the British Bulldog. I was a huge Stampede Wrestling fan. So the Dynamite Kid, Davy Boy Smith, uh, Bret Hart, Owen Hart, um, Bad News Allen, as one of the greatest heels uh, I've ever met. And in fact, I got to work with him when I called Stampede Wrestling. So uh, real career highlight as well because here's a guy. Jim, when I was 12 years old, I was literally uh, scared shitless of. Like, I truly believe Bad News Allen, who was Bad News Brown at w- WF, who I think would have been a tremendous mixed martial artist if the sport had been around uh, during his prime with his. Oh, yeah, because he, he, was he was a silver medalist. Yeah, the American. Right? Right, 76. You're right, the first African American to medal. But, but the fact that he scared the shit out of me legit as a, as a kid, and then I get to. to well, fuck, to he's scared. He's. Him, you know, he's 20 he, years later. He, 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 he scared the shit out of the boys, legit. Are you <laughs> so but you know what? You want to know something? Sitting under his, well, I don't want to say sitting under his learning tree, but but sitting next to him in his, his car on some of the road trips to Stampede, one of the most intelligent and yet uh, fiercely um, committed to to what he believed in. And we know what he talked about there. I mean, yes, he was very, uh, you know, aware of what his rights should have been. And he definitely not a guy who uh, you wanted to, to, to have uh, have a grudge with you. I'll tell you that much. He is someone you would like to stay on the pleasant, on the sunny side of his street, <laughs> yeah. so to speak, with bad you news. You better believe, yes, yes. So I've just been very lucky, Jim, to, to be around so much, and I hope for, you know, many, many more years. I, I just, uh, I love what I do, and I, 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 this is all I live for, which is, you know, the other thing people always ask, what do you do when you're not uh, working? Well, I'm preparing to, to, to work again, and I, I'm just glad that uh, I've been afforded these opportunities, and and I want to continue to to get better. Well, many more years. I guess we're we're stuck with you for the time being. And I I went to your website. <laughs> uh, I went to your website, Maroranalo dot com. Uh, folks, yes, it's, he's got a lot of cool shit up there, including your 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 bio. You've got some clips of various things you've done. It's a cool looking website. I'm jealous of you Thank there you. too. Maro dot com. And and where can they find you on Twitter if they want to uh, tw- Twitter you? Ranallo. Yeah, well, I, I'm, the whole concept is, is, is frightening in the best of times. But it's my name, M-A-U-R-O-R-A-N-A-L-L-O. And, and, not, and, and not even the, right? No, no, not the. I'm just a humble at, Canadian, Jim. Just at Mauro Ranallo. And, and Alice, you I, have in the past. Uh, oh, and, and, and Mar, real quick, and you do a podcast, right? Uh, I did. I did one, and uh, it's on hiatus. Something in the near. No, no, it's on hiatus right now. I got something well, else cooking, you. but uh, not right now. And Alice has has actually had had uh, Twitter uh, Twitterness with you. Has Twittered back and yes, forth. Yes, yes, she had to tweet me today because of my uh, my. Well, no, my I mean, I mean of timing. I've, well, actually, what what it is is that I've re, I've retweeted some of the things that you've tweeted because you and I share a I don't want to call it a passion because that's kind of an odd way to look at it, but uh, mental health advocacy. I, oh I, wow! In the sense that I think we're both I don't like to use the word sufferers because I don't suffer right. with my panic anxiety right. disorder or my depression. Um, they actually right. make me me and and allow me yes. to have kind of a unique outlook on the world. Uh, but it would be really cool to hear um, how you advocate. On the side of that. Wow, that's a very uh, good question. I'm glad I get an opportunity to uh, to talk about something that, yeah, obviously I'm very passionate about because since the age of uh, 19, I was diagnosed with bipolar affective disorder, and it has been a battle at times. But like you mentioned, Alice, I, I, I like to call it a gift and, and a curse because it is uh, – it has given me all this amount of energy and allowed me in many ways to, to flourish as a broadcaster. And yet, the flip side, 
where the, the, the moments you don't want to get out of bed or you, the, the, the feelings of hopelessness and, and suicide and, and just feeling like a fraud and the fear of failure to watch. I think everyone at one step or another in their life probably go through. But for me, in terms of the advocacy right now, I'm always uh, uh, giving uh, uh, talks to, to people when I'm on the road. I, I try to introduce myself as, as you know, more Ronello, and I have suffered from bipolar disorder and, and open up the conversation. I think that's the biggest thing that we're doing right now. And I truly believe in NAMI and, and what's happening on social media is just a discussion. I think the one thing we have to do is end the stigma of mental health issues of which so many professional wrestlers have had to deal with so many people in combat sports, uh, so many people in all walks of life. And yet, you know, with all due respect, uh, cancer has affected all of us. Well, I think mental health has as well. And I think the amount of attention and money that is going towards uh, finding a cure for, for cancer, which is necessary, I think the same amount of attention and, and money should be uh, using to, to save people's lives when it comes uh, to mental health, because one of four Americans will suffer from it. And, uh, you know, uh, Jim, I know you know him well as well. Larry Sweeney, the uh, the former pro wrestling manager, committed suicide. Chris Canyon, who was bipolar, yeah, has him yeah. on my show many times discussing it. And I, I, I get emotional even now knowing that they're no longer with us. But uh, really, I appreciate, Alice, you mentioning that because, to me, uh, as much as I enjoy what I do as a broadcaster, I, I think really the greatest gift broadcasting has given me is the opportunity to, to share this kind of message with more people than if I were not a broadcaster. So, again, thank you for, for letting me talk about it. Well, the reason I wanted to mention it is because a similar thing happens for me. I have a separate show, a different show from this called RWR. And whenever I talk about my mental health issues, that's the one time I really get a lot of letters from people saying, I awesome. never thought I'd tell somebody else about this, but I have. And then they'll list whatever the, what they happen to have. Oh, so, so you're, you're saying this is a cheap ploy then to, to increase your, your, your mail. Jim, what you're saying. <laughs> that is not what I'm saying. But but that's the whole idea. When when people who have a platform get the opportunity to speak with people who share these illnesses, uh, sometimes right. it makes them feel like, hey, maybe it's not just me, and maybe it's okay yeah. to talk about this. And that's how you start feeling I, better. And, and actually, and Alice does chasten me sometimes because I'm not as understanding as I should be with, with some people, because I'm much like uh, other things like typhoid Mary. I, when it comes to mental illness, I'm more of a carrier that infects those around me. And, and like, Alice actually was perfectly normal two years ago and look what happened there. So, but you, uh, are, it, <laughs> you are a treasure. You are an American treasure, Mr. Cornette. But I'll, oh, I, Mono, I, hey, you, yeah, know yeah, you ain't bad yourself, even though you're Canadian, but you're all, you're all the way out. From, you're out there from British Columbia. That's the cool side of Canada. Yeah. Right. Well, I, um, I, but I'll, I'll just Fuck to, Winnipeg. To wrap up. No, no, I was from Vancouver, but now, uh, now I'm in Los Angeles now. But uh, yeah, I no, yeah, to find yeah, what... I hate Winnipeg, the middle part of oh. Calgary because it's historic and and land storage awesome. gets a pass from me. Yeah, you know, yeah. but but I really I thought Winnipeg sucked, and I wasn't really warm on all of Quebec. And yeah, and I, Ontario I the last time on Winnipeg, but uh, Canada's a beautiful country. And uh, Quebec has its, uh, has, well, it's very historic. So I, I like, I like Vancouver. Beautiful. Yeah, Vancouver's, uh, it's one of, uh, you know, North America's prettiest cities with the water, the mountains, the, uh, the incredibly expensive real estate prices. Well, but, but Vancouver deserves better than the rest of the country, in my opinion, in some cases. And while we're talking about Canada, can we send a shout out to Lance Storm, who I know is listening right now from What's Calgary? Matter? What's the matter um, with Lance? Is Lance with no, he, he's in Canada and he's in Calgary, and I know he's listening. So, hey, Lance. Lance is <laughs> hey. better to do than listen to my program. Bullshit. He listens every week. The Storm Wrestling Academy is, is flourishing because of him. All right. Well, anyway, we've embarrassed everybody now just with all the fault <laughs> that we've gotten into. Morrow, I want to thank you very much. We will continue to follow your exploits uh, on New Japan on Axis and, and uh, Showtime Boxing and the, the various projects that we have detailed and your website and your Twitter. And thank you for being a part of the program. And, and hopefully we, you won't get any on you when you hear the stuff that we talked about before we brought you on, on the air. <laughs> it has been an honor, Mr. Jim Cornette. Alice, thank you so very much. And uh, when uh, when are we going to see you back in the, uh, the 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 biz, Mr. Cornette? When can I? Zoom, I, I will actually. 
at this point, I don't, I, I don't intend to live there again. I just visit from time to time. So <laughs> go to my website and you can find out the Corny Cade 2015 tour dates, none of which are near you. Uh, so right, we, we, well. we got to get together somewhere in the middle. Next time I come to Kansas city again, I, maybe I go as far as, as, uh, as, as Des Moines. And beat you in the middle. You out, I'm going to hold you to it. And, uh, and thank you again. Uh, first time I get to say it uh, publicly and on your show, you were, uh, you know, you, you entertained, but in many ways you inspired. So thank you very much for, uh, everything you did and uh, continue to do in the business my man. Thank you very much. And Mauro for Mauro Ronaldo, ladies and gentlemen, and Alice. Woo! Rad- I, am, woo, I am Jim Cornette, and another episode of The Experience has gone down the toilet, ladies and gentlemen. Tune in next week for a fresh load of crap.